Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Today, um, we're going to learn all about Social Media 101 with our special guest from Special Olympics, uh, Bridget Betsko, um, who will tell you all about um, everything you need to know to grow um, or to establish a strong social media following. Uh, before we get started today, um, we're just going to take a quick look at the agenda. So we'll run through a couple of our standard housekeeping items. We'll run through introductions. We'll get down to our conversation and, of course, handle any questions and answers towards the end of the discussion. As always, we're recording this session so that you can go back and watch later. Please feel free to share with your colleagues um, at your organizations. Um, we would love to get this information out to anybody who wants to learn. Um, a link to this recording will be emailed to you after the session. Um, and please stay on mute until the question and answer section. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat throughout, ask questions, make comments, um, and we'll engage that way. And then for the best view, if you um, take a look down here at the bottom of the screen where it says click view, then speaker view, or side by side speaker view, that'll give you the best um, overall view of our webcast today. So before we get started, if you could take just a moment to type your name, location, and organization name into the chat. We'd love to know where you all are joining us from today. Welcome, Glenn, joining us from Tampa. Well, as you join, please um, introduce yourself, um, take a minute to say hi, let us know um, what organization um, and community that you are joining us from. Um, I'm Abby LeMay, Director of Global Affiliate Initiatives here at the World Federation of Youth Clubs, and I am thrilled to be here with you today for our Social Media 101 webcast with Special Olympics. Um, there's so much to learn about social media, um, so I am uh, eager and excited to hear from an expert in uh, visual storytelling um, and communications, and I know that Bridget will have lots of exciting information um, and useful takeaways and resources to share with you today. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn our conversation over to Bridget, um, who's going to talk all things storytelling and social media. Great. Thank you, Abby. Um, and again, I just want to encourage everyone to keep dropping your intros in the chat because it's great to know who I'm talking to and great to be here with all of you. Um, to give a quick introduction of myself, um, I am Bridget Betsko. I currently work on the Special Olympics Global Youth and Education team, um, and I do multimedia storytelling and communications, so a range of things from social media to video editing to working with our young people to share their stories. We can jump right in. So to get us started with a little warm up, um, I wanted to start some interaction in the chat um, to learn about what you think makes social media content engaging. So in the chat, um, if you can share one thing that you look for um, from a brand or a page that you follow, or when you decide if you want to interact with someone on social media. So share one thing um, that you look for. And as you're doing that, I can go on um, to the next slide and talk through a few of mine. opportunities to share feedback. Love that. We can skip to the next slide, um, but please keep keep feeling free to add um, your thoughts in the chat. So as you're doing that, I did want to share a few qualities that I look for um, when I'm interacting or following a brand or an, even an individual on social media. So I'm a little bit biased with my background, but I always look for really great visuals. Um, and I think that this is true for anyone, great visuals can really draw people in. And what makes these visuals um, successful and engaging? 
So one thing that a lot of people do is coming up with a cohesive style for their social media pages. So you'll see sometimes on Instagram, um, someone's Instagram grid might look very cohesive. It might all use the same color palette. So that's something that can be very um, appealing and very visually pleasing to look at. And it's just um, nice to know that someone put the effort in to think through that. Another piece that's huge, um, especially for me working at Special Olympics, is accessibility. So making sure that any content I put out or that anyone's putting out um, is accessible to their entire audience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Another piece with visuals is creating visuals that are unique and creative. So I love to use social media to find ideas for my own work and to see what other organizations are doing. And if there's something unique and creative on a channel, I'm almost always going to follow it um, so I can see more of what they're doing. Visuals should be relevant to your work. Um, so if you're using like stock imagery, um, if it's not connected to the poster sharing, that can just add a little bit of disconnect with your audience. And then informative and storytelling. If I can look at a photo or an infographic or a video and know what you're trying to tell me right from the start, that makes that a lot more engaging and it's going to make me want to read the full post. And then finally, impactful. So again, if you have an infographic with data, have that data point be something really impactful that's going to draw attention. So the next piece um, that I think is really important is authenticity. Especially now, um, people are really looking for brands, organizations, individuals that they're following on social media to be authentic. So don't try to be someone you're not. Don't, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you're true to the values of your brand, um, that's, that's all we're looking for in authenticity. So with that, having a consistent voice is really helpful. Um, if you have a bigger social media team with multiple people, making sure that they all kind of know what you're going for. Um, so that it doesn't sound like 10 different people are writing all of your content. Transparency is also really important. Um, if you say you're going to do something on social media, following up and showing that you did it is really helpful. Um, being really honest and accurate with information you're putting out about your organization as well. Um, and self-awareness. And this kind of goes back to the um, past few points as well, but making sure that you know who you are. Um, and know who you're trying to show the world that you are. Um, have clear goals for what you want to accomplish on social media. This allows you to really um, structure your strategy to meet those goals, but it also gives you that kind of cohesive feel across your platforms. Walk the talk. Um, this is pretty simple, but I think it's really important. Again, if you say you're going to do something, do it. If you're posting, encouraging others to be inclusive or encouraging others to take action. Make sure that your organization is doing those things as well. Having strong values, again, if your social media reflects the core values of your organization, that really helps people connect with you. And then connection, I'll talk about pretty much on every slide that I talked through today. Um, but connection is just so important and it's so important for people to feel like they do have something to connect with you on and that you're not just this nameless, faceless brand. Um, so having people um, on your social media pages, whether that's staff members, volunteers, the young people involved in your programming, having people present on social media is really helpful. So the next category, as I mentioned, is really important to me working at Special Olympics. Um, but I also firmly believe it should be important to everyone. Accessibility benefits everyone, not just the folks who we might think of when we think of who needs these accessibility tools. So I've listed a few here um, just because some of them are less um, commonly used right now and just to familiarize people with them. So using alt text or image and video descriptions is really helpful to make sure that everyone can access content, even if you're using different forms of media. Thinking through accessible design choices, so these can include font size and color contrast, but it can also include things like not putting text over a really busy photo. Um, if it's hard for you to read text on an image, it's going to be really hard for someone to read text on an image 
um, if they have any difficulties with that. Video captions, um, again, I'm a little bit biased here. Um, I went to RIT in undergrad and we really had it instilled in us to have every single video ever captioned. Um, and that's what I strive for on social media. That's what I encourage everyone else to do. Any video content you're putting out into the world should have captions. Otherwise, it's not going to be accessible to your whole audience and you're eliminating a portion of that group that can access your content. And then two other pieces to think about, um, easy read text. So this is making your text or your copy accessible to anyone that's coming in. So thinking what is the lowest reading level of your audience and making sure the text matches that. And then also translations with so many of us working globally, thinking of ways you can offer translated content so everyone can access that again. So similar to um, Abby's response in the chat about some things she looks for, for opportunities to share feedback um, and participate in polls, social media is a great place to create opportunities for your community. So you can do this by creating educational content and giving them that opportunity to learn. You can create opportunities to interact and connect through challenges, through polls, through starting conversations and comments. You can give them opportunities to act and support or volunteer um, by letting them know of upcoming events, ways to get involved online, and other things like that. How to get involved. Again, if there's upcoming events, whether in person or online, that are open invites for people to attend, social media is a great way to spread the word. And if you are an organization that has um, programs or chapters in lots of different places, and you're open to expanding, social media is a great place to connect with people that might want to start up a chapter in their local community. And then finally, to promote, encouraging people to reshare your content, um, again, is just a way to reach more people and broaden your audience. And then the last category, um, as I mentioned, I'll come back to this theme a lot, is connection. So having those opportunities for conversations to build community um, and building that community through having opportunities to share experiences and find those links between people. One thing that's really important in social media and storytelling is listening. So when you are encouraging your community to start conversations, make sure you take a listening role sometimes and encourage them to take a listening role sometimes. Um, you can build connection through storytelling. I'll come back to that later as well. Um, but storytelling is a really great tool to build connection between people. Again, local and virtual events are a great opportunity for connection and providing different options for how to engage. So if you have a in-person event, a way to make that more accessible is having a few virtual options during it. Or if you're asking people to send you content rather than just asking for um, maybe a written blog post, also offer the option for someone to draw a picture if maybe writing isn't their comfort level. So with that, we can go to the next slide. So the next piece to think about is who is your audience? Um, sometimes different content might have different audiences, but it is really important to know who your audience is and be really specific. So as I'm talking through this next slide, share in the chat um, who your key target audience is and be as specific as you can. You can go to the next slide. So as you're sharing, um, I wanted to talk about how um, my team approaches creating content for different audiences, different platforms, or different purposes. So I've shared a few um, different screenshots here for examples of our work. Um, on the top left, you'll see our Faces of Inclusion book, which is um, basically a storybook with a story from each of our regions in our unified schools programs. And this gives us the opportunity to have, um, again, that connection through people. So we include stories of our students, of our teachers, of our families and volunteers to give people the opportunity to meet the people involved in our work. The second piece is a case study um, from our Global Center for Inclusion. And the case studies and the briefs that we release tend to have a more academic audience or a more um, policy-based audience. So oftentimes this, this content might have a bit of a higher reading level, might have fewer visuals, 
but we still try to maintain that same accessibility throughout and try to maintain a similar style. On the top right, you'll see just a screenshot of our um, Instagram page for Spread the Word Inclusion. So Spread the Word is a platform that's much more youth facing. Um, we do have followings kind of of all age levels and backgrounds, but we really work hard to engage youth there. So we keep our social media content really engaging. We try to have a lot of variety. We try to have a lot of opportunities for youth to participate. Um, on the bottom left here, you'll see a data point infographic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes on social media, these graphics that just have one key data point can be really impactful and tell people what your work accomplishes. And then you can include more information in additional images or in the caption. And then on the bottom right, um, you'll see a video that we have um, announcing one of our partnerships. And for this video, we did include um, the voices of leadership of Special Olympics and the Stuffers Nericos Foundation. More so than we included the voices of youth, which oftentimes our approach is to center the youth voice. Um, but here we paired those leadership voices with videos and visuals of our youth working. So I see some great um, answers coming in in the chat. And I think um, the, the last response about youth volunteers and youth development workers um, is very similar to kind of the audience that I work with. Um, and we tend to think about it as youth being at the center um, and then building this ecosystem around them of what are the other audiences connected to youth? Who are the people that influence youth? Who are the people that youth influence? And building that out into our larger kind of network of audiences. So we can jump to the next slide. So in addition to tailoring content to different audiences, you also have to tailor content to different platforms. Yes, you can just share the same photo and the same caption on every one of these platforms, but through changing your approach just slightly for each of these, you can really increase engagement and create some cool opportunities for connection and interaction. So on Instagram, of course, visuals are key. Um, one thing that I've learned in my time at Special Olympics, though, is don't forget about the Instagram stories. This is a great place to have those interactions. Um, and we've done this a lot by creating template graphics um, that our audience can use. Twitter, um, even though it does have the limited length for your character content, I think the limited length can be a really great tool to use to make sure that you're sharing only the most engaging information. I've also found that Twitter is a really great platform to follow and interact with other organizations that you want to connect with because you can do it um, in these really bite-sized pieces of information. With Facebook, we tend to have an older audience on Facebook, but Facebook also has really great analytics where you can see exactly who's looking at your page and kind of tailor your content to that. I've also found that Facebook is a great platform to share a wide variety of content. So we share videos and events and graphics that we create, but it's also a great place to share articles that might be related to your work or from other organizations um, on topics you care about. We've had some great engagement sharing that type of content. For LinkedIn, um, you can share content from your organization's page, of course, and you should, but in addition to that, LinkedIn is a really great place to kind of enlist members of your organization, whether it's leadership or any of your team members to be active in sharing this content as well um, and kind of build up their own LinkedIn followings. Again, this is a great place to follow um, related organizations and individuals. And it's a great place to start conversations um, about specific projects and work that you're doing. For TikTok, I know that TikTok is still new and exciting, and we're all still figuring out exactly the best way to use it. Um, but with TikTok, keeping content formal, or informal, sorry, <laughs> keeping content informal and making sure that you're really focusing on being authentic is important. Um, taking a video that you made for Facebook and just cropping it for TikTok won't be as successful as having um, a human face talking. Um, or just really short, fun content for TikTok. This is a great opportunity as well to involve young people. Um, so create a challenge, ask young people to create a video for your TikTok account um, and share those. 
Again, with TikTok, I always just want to encourage, remember to caption your videos. There is um, a caption feature directly in the app now. Um, so it's just really important for accessibility. The last piece I want to flag with different platforms is don't limit yourself to these five. Um, there's platforms that are popular in different regions. There's platforms that are popular with different groups. So look at your audience, look at the people you work with, ask them what platforms they use the most and see how you can be active there. And the other piece to this is don't limit yourself to social media. Look at your newsletters, your website, any other content you're putting out into the world and link them all together. Social media can point people to subscribe to your newsletter or to visit your website and your website can point people to social media. So make sure you're linking all of your platforms together. We can jump to the next slide. So one thing we've really prioritized um, on my team at Special Olympics is involving our whole community in our storytelling efforts and in our social media efforts. So we can go to the next slide. So on this slide, I wanted to share a few examples um, of the kind of template graphics and things like that that I mentioned previously. So on the top half of the slide, you'll see all of these Instagram story graphics that say things like, I am a business owner, I am a therapist, I am a politician, I am a journalist, I am an athlete leader, I am blank. Um, and that sentence is followed up by, I pledge to include because. So these are Instagram story templates that we used for Spread the Word Inclusion. Um, last year's Spread the Word Inclusion Day, actually. And we had huge success with these templates. We had hundreds of people, youth leaders, volunteers, Special Olympics programs, Best Buddies programs, um, tagging us in their use of these. We had people print them out, um, kind of get creative that way and use them at their like school events. Um, so we just have had great success with using these kind of templates um, to have people participate in our major days, our major activations. In addition to those, um, I also like to provide other social media graphics, even if they're not the kind of fill in the blank template that people can use if they want to promote our content. Um, so on major days, we'll kind of send around a folder of graphics that people can use. And this usually goes out to our Special Olympics regions and programs. Um, we'll sometimes send it out to our partners, especially if they're involved um, in the stories we're sharing. And then we'll often share these with youth leaders as well if it's something that um, they've participated in. So on the bottom, we'll see a few of these kind of example graphics that we've shared out before. And we can go to the next slide. Another thing we've done um, on the Global Youth Team at Special Olympics is in the past like year and a half or so, we've started this collective responsibility social media initiative. And this is internal. Um, it's mostly just our team right now, but we do share it with a few other members of the organization. And basically um, me and my team send out a weekly internal newsletter with about two to five stories or events, um, whether those are directly related to our team from the broader Special Olympics um, community or sometimes just related stories about disability inclusion. And along with each of these stories, we provide sample copy, we provide graphics and photos, videos if we have them. And basically our team members then can just copy paste the social copy and post on their own channels. And this has been a great way to involve our whole team um, in the social media process. It builds capacity because our team gets more experience using social media. So if we need additional support, they can step in now because they know how to do everything. Um, it gives us the opportunity to provide kind of bite-sized training each week because we usually include um, a social media tips section in these newsletters. And it allows us to reach different audiences um, because our members of leadership versus our interns have very different communities on their social media. So we get to reach um, their friends and their families and peers. Um, so it's been a really great exercise for us that we've kind of continued to build on um, over the past year and a half. With that, we can go to the next slide. So for our last piece of kind of this community participation in our storytelling, 
Um, and this one to me is the most important and the most fun um, to work on is our youth-led storytelling. So I love to be able to involve our youth leaders in the storytelling process um, in a number of different ways. So we just had our virtual Global Youth Leadership Summit last weekend. And as part of that summit, we've done a few different things. We have um, those social graphics that I mentioned available for regions and programs, partners, and our youth leaders to use. Um, but we also have an open call for content out. So youth leaders that attended the summit can send us photos they took, they can write up a blog post, they can draw a picture, they can make a vlog and share that with us. So we can just see how they want to tell the story of their experience at the summit. And then we have some more targeted approaches. So I have a few specific youth leaders identified that are writing blog posts. And from that, we'll create a few quote graphics for social media that can be shared out when those posts are published. And we're also doing interviews with youth leaders. Um, so we're interviewing a youth leader from each region and putting all of those voices together in one video. Outside of the summit, um, we're doing some more youth-led storytelling where they're really leading the whole process. So we have our youth innovation grants um, projects going on and the youth leaders that are leading those projects are expected to share storytelling content with us. So through, for that, we support them by giving them resources and training on storytelling, on photography and videography. And if they ask us specific questions or need specific support, we're able to provide that. One other piece um, is really making sure that since our work is so youth focused, that we're centering youth voices. Um, it should not be just a bunch of adults on our social media pages all the time. Um, so we want to make sure that youth voices are always present in our stories. Um, and when needed, um, when we do need to bring in voices of leadership or our partners as much as possible, trying to pair them with those youth voices. And the last piece, um, and this goes back to accessibility, is empowering young people to share stories the way they want to. So of course, sometimes you need a video or you need a blog post, but if you're just asking, hey, can you tell me what your experience was like? Give them the opportunity to share that in the way that's the most comfortable for them, whether that's writing, drawing, photography, videography, just give them that opportunity to have a little bit of freedom. We can go to the next slide. So I wanna close with just a few thoughts on storytelling. Um, as I said at the beginning, stories have a lot of power to build understanding and build connections um, between people. So I think that stories are really important and any content that you're putting out, anytime you can incorporate true storytelling into that, it will be more impactful and more engaging. So I have some quick tips um, for storytelling on the next slide. So the first piece, and this is something that I had um, plenty of professors and speakers at workshops say um, as I was studying photojournalism, is you need to make them care. So why should someone that has no connection to Special Olympics, that doesn't care that much about inclusion, why should they care? Why should they start taking action to make a more inclusive world? So one way to make people care is give them someone to connect with. So this goes back to always including people when possible. But beyond that, you need to find those things that connect all of us. So just because um, someone is playing basketball doesn't mean that your audience member is playing basketball and then therefore cares about that, but finding something that they do care about. So using conflict and change to show those things that are so core to everything we experience. Um, you can also make people care um, across different types of audiences by combining the emotions and the sensory details of a story with data. Um, so some folks won't be interested in a topic unless they see data and numbers to tell them why it's important. And some people won't be interested in a topic unless they have that human aspect. So combining the two um, broadens your audience and makes those stories more impactful. The second piece is use visuals. You don't need visuals for everything, but it can be really helpful. Visuals help audiences connect with people and 
it improves the understanding of kind of what's taking place. So if you're telling the story of an event, using visuals will help people visualize um, what it was like to be there and connect better with your story. One kind of simple tip for visuals is variety is key. So you wanna make sure you're showing emotions, faces, moments of connection, and really focusing on people. But you also wanna show things like details of um, event materials or hands working, things like that, and scene setting imagery. So wide shots of um, an event space to again, give people that full picture of what it was like to be there and give them that connection to the people involved. The final piece I have um, is to use stories as a tool to build your network. Stories can help maximize your reach and your impact, um, especially if you use those tailored approaches to different platforms and different audiences. So on Instagram, you might use a photo or a quote graphic to bring people into the story. On LinkedIn, you might highlight the data and then link out to the larger story that you get to meet the people in. Stories are also a great opportunity to provide those opportunities um, for your audience to engage with you. So include a call to action, whether that's to volunteer at an event, subscribe to a newsletter, or to support your work. And you can really customize that call to action to your needs, but stories give you that great opportunity to tack that on at the end to bring your audience in and continue that engagement with them. So with that, um, that is my main um, slides for the day, but I'd love to take any questions. Um, I also have provided a resource list that I believe Abby will be sending out um, in the email, and it is a link to a living document, so it'll be continually updated um, with other resources. But feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or email me if you have any additional questions after today. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, I learned a whole lot and I'd love to open it up for questions or comments or just kind of general discussion about what your clubs are doing with social media, no matter where you're at in the process. So feel free to come off mute and uh, chat with our, our presenter. Or if you're feeling shy and don't want to come off mute, that's okay too. Um, you can put your questions and comments into the chat box. It's been a really common theme for us this year at WFYC about storytelling. Um, so Bridget, I was, I was really glad to hear you talk about some of those storytelling tips in that last slide. Um, just a couple of months ago, we had um, a storytelling webinar called Universal So They Relate, Specific So They Care, and some other storytelling tips. So I hope that the um, WFYC network is taking in all of these uh, great pieces of information and, and practical tips tips. Um, storytelling is certainly a core central piece to our organization's success. Agreed 100%. Anybody have questions or, or comments to share? Um, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, well, if you do think of any additional questions um, or comments for Bridget, her contact information is available here. Um, as always, this session is recorded, so it'll be available to refer back to later. Um, there's some slides that Bridget shared with us that have some really useful information, so I'll make sure that those slides are included in our follow-up along with those living document resources that Bridget mentioned. Um, before we wrap up today, just a couple of quick reminders from WFYC. Um, you'll hear from me in the next couple of days with a follow-up survey. Um, please take a moment to complete that so we can always um, continue to improve this program. Um, speaking of this program, the next webcast is June 23rd on end-of-year fundraising. So um, it might feel a little bit early to be talking about end-of-year fundraising, but it will be here before we know it. So please join us in June to plan ahead. Ed, um, to make sure that you are ready um, to raise as much um, as many funds and new supporters as you can um, for the end of the year. 
Um, for club leaders, please uh, be aware that Promise Award nominations are open through May 31st. We received many applications um, and we encourage you to continue um, nominating folks, um, youth leaders and programs who are making an exceptional difference in your club and community. Uh, we're looking for folks of all different backgrounds and different experiences and accomplishments. Um, so please continue to submit those nominations on our website through May 31st. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, um, or feedback to share with WFYC, please feel free to send us an email at admin at WFYC.org. WFYC has a wide range of resources available to member organizations. So whether you are currently a member or considering becoming a member, um, here's just a quick overview of the uh, many different features and support uh, that WFYC offers youth development professionals around the world. And with that, I just want to thank you for attending today. Um, and I want to thank Bridget Fesco from Special Olympics um, for sharing her time and talent uh, with us today. Um, good luck with all of your social media endeavors. Don't be afraid to reach out with questions um, or concerns um, to WFYC or to Bridget. Thank you again. Um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you for having me.